Hello everybody, you're very welcome to the monthly cycles. Um, we're going to give it a little bit of time and just we'll let people arrive. It's a rainy old evening, some people may have got delayed. Um, and we have our panel, as you can see, assembled in front of us. And I'll be introducing everybody and we'll take our time going through some presentations and some talks. Um, and we're going to really also take our time to, hello Mimi, um, <laughs> and to really sort of uh, mull over some of the questions that are going to come up and share. And we're really excited that Mimi Scheller, whose book I just happen to have here called Mobility Justice, is also joining us. Um, and Minister Eamon Ryan, Minister for Transport Eamon Ryan, is dealing with Brexit and that's impeding him from getting to this, which he really wants to get to rather than sort out Brexit. So we're hoping that he'll be able to make it as well. Um, so I'll just give it maybe one or two more minutes and then we will kick off. And we might wrap up just after eight, um, and depending on how many questions we get and how everybody is faring. Um, and if it goes on, then we'd be delighted to hear more questions. It's really an opportunity for us as, as Monthly Cycles. We're, um, we'll talk a little bit more about who Monthly Cycles are and, and what we get up to. But it's really an also an opportunity for us to talk, um, to kind of raise our profile a little bit and talk about what we do and talk about all the questions that we want to raise when it comes to active transport and uh, public space. Great. Okay. So I think I might be ready to start. What do you guys think? Is everybody ready? Okay. All panelists ready to go? If anybody needs to go for a wee? Just let me know if you need any comic relief. I'm, I'm up first, just to, yeah. I might need some. If I get nervous, I might need some, but so far so good. And it's nice to have some friendly faces to look at as well. Right, okay. So um, we're gonna kick off, um, make yourselves comfortable and two maybe housekeeping type things that I'm gonna say. I'm Louise Williams, I'm part of Monthly Cycles and I'm gonna chair this and kind of try and guide us um, through these amazing speakers but also guide some of the, the questions that are going to come up. Um, so two housekeeping points, one being we're gonna record this, uh, we are recording this, so um, that's just part of what we want to do in order to make sure that we can, oh, female panel, yes, exactly, it's brilliant. Uh, we might be letting Eamon Ryan in, it's a bit, it's a bit touch and go at the moment. Um, uh, but yeah, we're gonna record this because we want to spread the word, that's one thing. And the second thing is there is, um, a facility for you to ask questions and chat with each other. We're going to monitor it and we're going to keep uh, track of it and we just want to make sure that everybody feels free to comment and we'll try and get to all of um, all of the comments that are made along the uh, the course of the evening. And, and these could be comments for somebody in for one of us in monthly cycles or it could be comments for one of the panelists. Feel free um, to, to, to add to the conversation. All right, so I'm going to start officially now that we've got the housekeeping out of the way. You're very welcome to this webinar. It's, uh, we've called it Inclusion and Mobilities. And as I said, it's organized by Monthly Cycles. You may be aware of us. We're a Dublin-based initiative. Our aim is to bring women together. Uh, we do it once a month uh, and it's an inclusive cycle. We go around the city, we visit different parts of Dublin and we bring women of all different ages and abilities together and, just, and explore Dublin together. And What's brilliant about uh, September is that it's, we've been doing this for 12 months. So we've had 12 uh, monthly cycles. We couldn't celebrate because of COVID, um, but we do want to celebrate in the future, um, the community that we're building. So as well as getting out and about and cycling together, we also advocate for social inclusion and mobility. And that's a big part of what we do as a group. And this webinar is part of a process that Monthly Cycles is leading. We're calling for equality and for justice to be at the heart of how we design public space and how we move around, how we create mobility options. So we as a group believe that racial justice, the rights of queer and trans people, women's rights, and the rights of the disabled community must be included in the design of public space and transport. So these groups have historically, as, as many of us know, been excluded from the design of our cities and our towns and our rural areas and how we get around them. And this webinar is the aim that we have for this evening is to facilitate a discussion on inclusion in our transport, in our mobilities and our public space. We want to ensure that an understanding of diverse identities and needs is built into our planning for walking, for cycling and beyond. 
So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Monthly Cycles Research. Um, we're, we are undertaking a research project. Um, it's supported by Dublin City Council. We're incredibly grateful. We're a small voluntary group and it's brilliant to get support from Dublin City Council. Um, we're looking into these issues. We were hoping that we'd be able to launch it this week, but look, good things are worth waiting for and we will have it ready soon. And you're going to be hearing more about it. Um, there will be recommendations around the public sector duty and around justice issues within uh, mobility and transport. So we're looking forward to advocating on that. So as I mentioned, chat function, feel free to get chatting. I can see love, lots of people uh, uh, responding already, which is brilliant and keep, keep them coming. We will be monitoring it and gathering up your questions and we'll come to them and so keep them, keep them coming. Okay, I'm very briefly going to introduce our panel this evening and I'll go into a little bit more depth about their biogs when I get to each speaker, if that's okay. So I've got Finola Driscoll from the NTA. She's going to present the Bike Life Report. Evie Nevin is from the Social Democrats. She's a disability rights activist. Maho Rivas is from Cork as well. She sings mus musicals and she's a very strong cycling advocate as well as an advocate for the rights of migrants. Joan O'Connell is one of the co-founders of Monthly Cycles. Janet Horner is here, Green Party councillor and uh, just appointed chair of the Walking and Cycling Committee and co-founder of, of the Monthly Cycles as well. And we have uh, Anya Tuberty as well, who's going to be keeping an eye on the chat and is also one of the Monthly Cycles crew. And with that, I think I'm ready to start and to kind of start with our first speaker. As I mentioned, um, we do have uh, Mr. Eamon Ryan popping into us at some point. So if it's okay with everybody, because he's dealing with Brexit and we're going to have a short time with him, I may have to interrupt somebody along the way if he does jump in. So just be prepared for that. Um, and if that's okay with everybody. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is Finola O'Driscoll, and you're very welcome, Finola. You're a project manager with the National Transport Authority um, and the National Transport Authority, the NTA, published the recent Bike Life Report, which made for really interesting reading. And we've, we've asked you to come on to talk about the insights on diversity in cycling um, that have come out from the report, if you're ready. Sure, thank you, Louise. I'm just gonna share, there we go. Thanks everyone. Thanks for the invite to to to, to speak today. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the bike life report. Um, and as much as I can, there's such great information in there. Do have a look at the website, and there's I, I made sure we put everything up there, including all the cross tabulations across gender, ethnicity, and um, as, as social economic grouping stuff like that. So there's a, there's a wealth of stuff in there that I I'm not even aware of and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to people delving into it and bringing those insights to the fore. Um, bike life is an assessment of, of cycling. It's basically taking that old adage, you value what you measure. So um, it's, it, it's, it, we did it with SusTrans who've been doing it for a few years with um, UK cities. It's based on the, the Copenhagen cycle report, which is, has been instrumental in developing that city as a cycle uh, friendly and people friendly city so yeah the value what you measure so it's a kind of snapshot and synopsis of cycling um in the dublin metropolitan area um where we looked at we gathered up information on infrastructure um which is great really useful behavior data based on a big survey and um, who's cycling where are they cycling why are they not cycling if they're not cycling how far what destinations that kind of thing um, because the, the census doesn't ask an awful lot about travel and um, perceptions data and impacts data. We worked with the HSC, uh, Road Safety Authority and EPA amongst others to get the health, economic and environmental impacts of cycling in the greater Dublin area. Um, well, actually, sorry, it wasn't the greater Dublin area. It's, it's this kind of amalg it, it, amorphous group within not quite Dublin, not quite the GDA. It's the it's the uh, metropolitan area. So that's that's the map of it from Donabay to Kilcock to Greystone. So it does include quite kind of rural or, or um, uh, low density area. And um, so the resident survey, which is kind of the heart and soul of bike life was conducted last summer so summer 2019 when the world was a very different place um, and we it was door to door and they had to, it was demographically representative of each electoral district so I don't know how many thousands of doors they had to to knock on in order to get that but um, yeah it's whether they cycled or not so key to the statistics is kind of a snapshot of 1100 people in Dublin Adults over 16, what do they feel about cycling? How, what, how did they, uh, and, and travel in general, actually. And there's a plus or minus 3% error 
Okay, key stats. Um, cycling is a lot more prevalent than we than we had previously thought. Really, twenty four percent one in four adults cycle at least once a week. So, yeah, and fourteen. I, I'm just highlighting the the gender statistics here, um, or the key gender statistics. But we'll come back to those a bit later. Um, fourteen percent of women cycle at least once a week. So there's clear there's a clear disparity there. Eleven uh, percent cycle five days a week or more. And that's 5% of women and 21% of people don't cycle, but would like to start. Uh, that's actually more for women and more for the physically disabled. Um, it was self, uh, it, during the survey was it, you, you self-selected as, as physically disabled and, and um, also uh, it, there was other options in, in disabilities to select. Sorry, I kind of get tongue tied when I'm talking about disability because I never know what's the right phrase. <laughs> so, um, so um, key reasons for not cycling: safety was the number one, uh, and that's really any 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 questions around safety. Women were much likely to rate safety as a higher concern. Um, poor weather it's twenty four percent. We know that's probably more to do with perception in lots of cases. Uh, because it doesn't rain as much in Dublin as in Amsterdam, for example. Um, but you know, it, we do have we have poor weather and maybe poor clothes and poor, poor approaches to it and that sort of stuff and poor destination facilities and all of that thing that can be tied in with poor weather. Um, interesting for me was the next view: not confident cycling and not for people like me. That adds up to thirty three percent. So that's the same as safety, as in terms of a barrier as to why people don't cycle. Um, and what would help i'll come back to the not for people like me because it, that that had a big there was a big difference there when we looked at socioeconomic groupings um what would help people cycle more well segregation is the top answer um either greenways like that got 70 percent would like completely traffic free and then 69 physically separated cycle tracks um, and that's 65 percent of women say that that would help them cycle more which is not what this gentleman is doing here, <laughs> but we're we're keeping it real. That's that's that is the current situation, and for lots of people, um, and eighty four percent of residents, whether they cycled or not, whether they wanted to cycle or what, whether they had any intention, would support building more protected on road cycle tracks, even if it meant less room for other road traffic. So that's a big mandate there for change, at least at the general level, and I come back to that later. Inclusivity. There's a big imbalance in terms of particip cycling participation in Dublin and I'm using Dublin as a shorthand for Dublin metropolitan area and there's a big gender and age imbalance not so much an ethnicity imbalance but maybe if we drill into that with age and gender there could be more there um, yeah so we have a big fall off in terms of, of age um, in participation um, it's it's kind of encouraging to see forty percent of these these this graph is the um, residents who cycle at least once a week. So we've got forty percent of people between sixteen and twenty five. That goes down to six percent over at the age sixty six. And just to say, this isn't a biological or you know in, in, imperative here because in the Netherlands fifty five percent of all trips are by women, and those over sixty five are making the same amount of trips as those um, as. Or sorry, higher than any other age group over the age of 26. So um, it's not it's not always the case that this this doesn't have to be the case. Um, and we see that disability as well um, is a big is it has a big impact on whether people cycle. So just to drill in to the gender difference a little more than half of women, 56 percent claim they do not cycle and do not want to compared with over. Um, and 39% of women would rate cycle safely, safety in their area as good compared to 56% of men and 29% of women would rate children's cycle safety in their local area as good compared with 47% of men. And having scanned through all of the bike life statistics and the, you know, the, the tables, I think it's, it's these key ones that show the that that are showing the biggest disparity between the genders so it's safety um and whether you're going to whether they want to cycle or not okay moving on to social inequality and mobility so it's always worth bearing in mind 20 percent of residents in the dublin area don't have 
a car available for their household and that stacks up with the census. Um, and the, it's the residents that are least likely to cycle and that don't have the car, that they're also the le residents least likely to cycle. So it's kind of, a, a, we're talking about social, you know, mobility justice and mobility opportunities. It's those people who are kind of, the the the, uh, the concern about safety, not confident cycling, not for people like me, are making a big impact in terms of their their ability to to access opportunities, um, because they don't have the car available. They're also usually, you know, in areas where maybe public transport isn't as dense. Um, so yeah, the big difference between a uh, proportion of residents who think that, like, the big difference in economic. Sorry, the big difference between those who feel that cycling isn't for them is it comes down to kind of socioeconomic grouping. So only 8% of the ABs think cycling isn't for people like them, where it's 22% of the of people in groups D and E. So it does show that being a cyclist is kind of associated with a certain type of person, perhaps, which is interesting. And this just shows what can be accessed within a 25 minute cycle. Um, we do think of Dublin as a sprawling city, but there's quite a lot that can be accessed within a, a decent cycle and not too strenuous a cycle. And of course, e-bikes can extend that range and they're extending that range. Um, economic benefits, so I suppose the key one here is that for, this, this, this was a very, very detailed societal gain model. Um, and it's all there for you to look at, but the net benefit for individuals and society for each kilometer cycled instead of driven is one euro, uh, almost two round. <laughs> but um, when you think that the average and uh, kilometers driven by anyone in Ireland is 17, 18,000, you can see how that really starts stacking up in terms of benefit for the economy and for individuals um, uh, spend. Look, environmental benefits, 20% of our greenhouse gas emissions are from transport and that's increasing. And last year, cycling in Dublin, the amount of people that did cycle in Dublin saved um, 28,000 tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions, which is the equivalent of 400,000 people flying from Dublin to London. So the um, health benefits, it's all in, I know I'm speeding through all of this, but it was interesting to me when we were putting this, this work together with, with modeling in the UK and with the HSC that depression was one of the biggest um, uh, uh, long-term health conditions that can be benefited by cycling. Uh, we, we all know about coronary heart disease and, and maybe some of the other physical ones, but depression and dementia are, are, were right up there. Um, cycling in those people who are cycling in the, G, in the metropolitan area are saving the HSC have equivalent of 83,000 GP visits. Um, and it was hard to work out the ad early adult deaths just for the metropolitan area, but it's 1,100 early, early adult deaths, deaths are, um, according to the EPA, are occur in Ireland where air pollution is a contributory factor. And again, it's always worth saying, here's our lovely new cycle track on um, Kerrysford Avenue, but one in five Irish children are obese. It's probably more like one in four now and that daily active travel is ideally placed to guard against obesity. Um, so while our mind is on a public health emergency, we know that this is, this is one that is the ticking time bomb in terms of a public health emergency. So um, it's, it's, it's good to kind of, often these, these didn't hit home, the early adult deaths and, and, and obesity and, and the health benefits really didn't kind of hit home, but they do now. We all have a kind of felt sense of what, of what, um, of what epidemiology is about really. Um, okay, so um, I'm probably way over time, but just yeah. to say of the, of the 15 um, cities that did a bike life report, the Dublin metropolitan area was the only one where pe residents wanted to see more spend on cycling than anything else. Um, so this was proportionate who'd like to see more government spending, cycling top the pole and driving is 34%. There's a lot of support for different measures, like increasing space for socializing, reducing speed limits on roads, restricting through traffic. Not a huge amount, like this was the lowest, the closed streets outside schools. It still got a majority in favor, but it was, it was much lower than others. But just to say, it's not kind of as simple or as like everything in life, there's nuance there. There was other questions put in and people tended to want everything really. At the same time, 64% of Dubliners would support more car parking along their local main street. 
and something like 70% wanted to make it easier to drive around their local areas. So people, there's a bit of cognitive distance there or at least some sort of trade-offs that aren't kind of clicking um, with people. Um, mm -hmm. or maybe this, this, the idea that the, there's limited space is just not, not uh, clicking in yet. Um, so yeah, which, which goes to say bike life is just one tool. When you look at it and the, the, the stats are amazing and, and, and you know, overwhelming support really, you can think, well, why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we rolling it all out everywhere? Um, and the issue is, as everyone knows, you know, we get down to street level and it becomes a, a street fight. So because, because it's all about roads, road space reallocation and the politics of space really, um, so bike life is one tool in changing culture. It does give a wider societal view than is heard on individual projects. And it did get cited in the Irish Times editorial about their, their view on, on cycling infrastructure needs at, at a tipping point. Um, it's one of many wedges. I've been long saying it and I'll be forever saying it. I think in my career, cycling and walking projects are change management projects. Mm. Um, they need a lot of different tools and different wedges underneath the, the stone to get it moving. Um, and, maybe, and, and maybe some of those wedges are broadening out this discussion so we don't just get the male, white male road engineers sitting around the table doing the planning, but it's about kind of really broadening it out so that we allow space for this diversity of experiences and needs to take part in that discussion i guess when we come when it comes to designing and planning routes for the for the for the bus connects or cycle routes for that matter yeah yeah i mean the more i think we need just more and more and more and more tools and more collaboration um um more communication more focused and um structured community engagement so it's not just you know the, the very unnuanced kind of i'm anti this i'm on the whatsapp group you don't have time to think about it but you're my mate and we our kids go to school together so you'll sign this or whatever you know just but but you know we're not living in a world that nuance is is promoted really but it, so it, yeah but we're, it's it's all of those wedges uh, and i do think school-based initiatives are very important because not only are, yeah, school based for, for as I see it, and it could be backed up. School is one of the kind of last physical hubs of, of a community. Like we've lost, you know, the church and and even now with the pub. But so this is one of the only places, and it was like this anyway before COVID, where people get together and absorb societal norms from each other. Um, and I hope that's not just because I'm a mum and that's where my head is at. Like, but at least you know you can see outside of school if if if, if the place is chock a block with parking chaos that does send a sort of norm about our, how our society works how travel works um which you kind of don't get in other areas along the uh, uh, in, in other parts of the street really it's not that to that level of intensity so i think school-based focused initiatives give a huge amount not just obviously for active travel and all the benefits that gives it but for it is a, it's the kind of a foci of cultural change i think so yes that's probably where i'm at here we go i'm going to end, end us up in positive because there's black rock and in and, and we all it's it's doing well and everybody is being really impressed and delighted and, and inspired and energized by how quickly things have changed there um and yeah there's a lot of infrastructure planned there always has been <laughs> <laughs> but um, like there's there's a momentum behind it. There's big ticket infrastructure projects on the way. There's there's bus connects. There's there's five year plans coming from the NTA, um, and there's a big opportunity to grow cycling. Mm -hmm. So there's the twenty one percent that currently don't cycle but would like to, and fifty four percent that feel they should cycle more. Plus we have, at least in the suburbs, a lot a kind of a, a boom in cycling at the moment during COVID, um. Go look on the full report. I'd say there's people on this on this call that can do a lot more and in-depth analysis and better than I can, and and will be coming back to me with all the information. Um, it's all there. It's cross tabs. Go for it. Um, and yeah, there's there's a huge amount of information there. So I was delighted to be part of this report. I think it's a really important. Uh, 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 kind of milestone really in 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 cycling and so thank you for allowing me to share the information no we really appreciate you coming on and we also had this feeling when we when we saw it and, and looked at, at, at it and um, 
that A, it captures a really interesting moment, which is changing with COVID, but B, there's so much of it that we'd like to dr drill into more and find out more uh, about. It opens up some really interesting questions, which is what we're here this evening to do as well. It might be worth mentioning, Fanola, I think you need to go at about eight. So if people do have specific questions, we can always kind of funnel them your way as we're going along, if that's okay with you, because I know you just need to... You need to... Sure. Well, I can. I think the kids are being put to bed by my okay. <laughs> husband, so we can. I can hide up here for another while. <laughs> That's fantastic. Great. Okay, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you very much, Nola. Um, so in the chat function, please do share your questions um, and comments, and we'll get to them as we're we're going along. So I'm going to move on to the next speaker, um, and the next speaker is Evie Nevin, who is the vice chairperson of the Social Democrats. So Evie is a disability rights activist um, uh, from Clonakilty in County Cork, and she's on the board of Employability, which is an organisation which helps people to get into employment. Evie, how are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for, for having me on this evening. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah? Perfect. Yeah. Like I said, West Cork Rural Broadband, not the best, so just bear with me in case anything happens. So yeah, I'm Evie Nevin. I live with a rare disease called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, which affects my mobility. It's a genetic condition, um, which uh, causes my collagen uh, to be produced in a faulty way. Um, so I must highlight that while I, uh, I am a wheelchair user, I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user, which means I only uh, use the wheelchair when I have to. I do have the use of my legs. So if my hips are dislocated, if my pain is very bad, or the days where my fatigue or my blood pressure is uh, being a bit bothersome, I have to use the wheelchair. So obviously living in Tonicilty, I'm considered to be living in rural Ireland. And so as you can imagine, I would face quite a few more challenges when it comes to inclusion and accessibility than somebody maybe in an urban setting. That's not to say though that there aren't any issues. In our cities, I've experienced many difficulties in Dublin city centre too. Um, so I started using the wheelchair in 2014 and uh, some people might find this hard to believe but I have never been on a bus with my wheelchair and this is something I've been very vocal about in the local media and it was part of my campaign last year during the local elections. Um, so where I'm situated is about 45 minutes away from Cork City. So in order for me to take the bus to Cork City I would have to travel 30 minutes by car in the opposite direction to go to the accessible bus stop and then which will obviously take longer and go back the way we came again through Clonakilty. Um, bus Erin does have uh, wheelchair friendly buses for my route uh, but they say that the location of the bus stop and the way that the footpath is situated there at the bus stop it doesn't allow for the wheelchair lift to be to come out of the bus and uh, they say it's a safety issue and the local authority i've talked to them about it and they're saying it's a job for the nta and it, a lot of the stuff is kind of being pushed around you know there's been promises made now back in june that the the bus stops will be looked at but we're wait and see um so there are two bus stops um in Skibreen and there's only one other bus stop in Kinsale so that's three accessible bus stops for the entirety of West Cork and we are the largest constituency in the country if you think of it that way. Um, so it, there was other kind of issues with, with the buses or the infrequency and, and things like that so uh, private local bus links have established in the last year or so and they provide wheelchair friendly transport uh, for one user. And they also accept travel passes, which obviously will make it like the number one choice now for people with, with physical disabilities. Uh, the private links, uh, for the, the routes are far more extensive, so they'll go from town to town. Um, whereas, like what I explained earlier about having to go one way to get to the other, it's the same as well. If I want to go 20 minutes another way uh, north, I would have to go back nice. east and then go around again. So it's, it's all a bit... Um, bit West Cork really is the only way to describe it. <laughs> um, but um, so like we here in Cork Southwest, we have over 11,000 people with disabilities and 42% of those people have physical disabilities. They have problems with their mobility. So like these buses are actually, these accessible routes are actually needed. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of things like tourism, we're stopping a whole portion of society being able to come and visit us here in the summer months. 
Um, so obviously public transport is in dire need of, of change, um, you know, not just for for people with disabilities, but for those who are commuting as well, um, because obviously um, with the way the routes work, it's it's confusing for a lot of people, not just for, for people with disabilities. Um, so not just the buses, but like I will not travel alone at all if I'm in my wheelchair. Um, I just can't because even if I can get on a bus or a train after giving them notice that I need to get on the bus or the train, um, then there are always issues that I still face uh, one way or another, particularly with our streetscapes. Uh, and this is something that definitely should be kept in mind if we're adding walking and cycling lanes in our town centres. We have to make sure that there's still enough of path to facilitate mobility aids and buggies. And I think the minimum clearance is two metres, actually. Um, so that's quite a, quite a large portion of the footpath that needs to be clear. Um, in terms of things like walking and cycling infrastructure, we don't actually have any mm. here in West Cork. You can cycle the whole way down the, the Wild Atlantic Way on the West Coast. Uh, the minute you hit West Cork, there is nothing at all. And again, uh, in terms of tourism, it's a massive missed opportunity because we know that there's you know, cycling routes um, all the way through Euro Europe and it comes over to Ireland and you can go all the way down. The minute you hit West Cork, there is nothing there and it just it does become unsafe um, in a lot of areas and particularly on our main roads. Um, Tallykilty in particular is a really, really active town and we host marathons and we have a lot of people who live very active lifestyles of all ages. The roads are always full of runners and cyclists. Uh, so these infrastructures would be constantly used if they were put in place and again like i said promoting tourism and um, a greenway was built going from the town to our local technology park where we have um a lot of the town employed uh, the greenway was perfect for anybody who was living in town and wanted to leave the car at home uh, however the greenway did stop short of that technology park which meant people couldn't avoid being on the road so I believe that section is going to be finished at some point, but the starting and stopping is quite frustrating. Um, like we all know, it, it could be nerve wracking for anyone on a bike to share the road with cars. And we all see and hear what can potentially happen uh, when cycle lanes are not provided. So if you can imagine how nervous you might be uh, as a person with a disability, particularly if you're using something like a recumbent bike, you know, the kind of the reclined bikes, um, and they're harder to see, particularly by bigger vehicles. Uh, disabled people are most likely to be seen as pedestrians or drivers um, when it comes to transport policy, and they're rarely thought of actually as cyclists, but many surveys all over the world show that if it was facilitated for it, then disab disabled people would cycle, and, and already uh, many of them do. Uh, many people with disabilities actually find cycling easier than walking. Yeah, no, it's a good point. And um, there's an organisation in the UK called Wheels for Wellbeing, which does yeah. amazing work on that. Mm -hmm. um, can I ask you, Evie, a question? Um, and I'll have to kind of at some point move on to the next speaker as well. But what, what does that mean for you when you hear the term that we use, uh, mobility justice? What does that, what does that resonate? How does that resonate with you? Or what does it sort of make you think of? And how does it fit with you? Yeah, I, I, I think what the, the words conjure up um, being inclusive of people with disabilities as well, um, I think so. Um, and I th and it, I'm happy to see that uh, more and more uh, community organisations and community groups are being more inclusive of people with disabilities. But I suppose it's just a case of providing the things like funding and training and things like that as well. Yeah, yeah it's not... It's it's maybe a process, but and um, that's that's a nice, it's a nice uh, insight that we have anyway. Um, okay, listen, stay with us, and and if, I, as I mentioned, you know, in the chat function, uh, you can we're monitoring it, and um, thanks for all the comments that are coming in and bringing more questions in. Um, Evie, if it's okay, I'm going to move on to Maho. We're going to stay in Cork. Um, so Maho Rivas uh, cycles around Cork while singing musicals. She is a sister of the Monthly Cycles crew in Dublin. Um, sometimes she wears cocktail dresses and she always aspires to be cycle chic, as evidenced here this evening. Uh, she, Maho is a human rights lawyer who has amazing experience. Um, and I've just lost my line there of your, okay. You've worked in the areas of women's rights, sexual reproductive rights, the rights of migrants, disability rights, and of course, cycling advocacy. And over to you, Maho.
Brilliant. Can you hear me there? Yeah, fabulous. Uh, now, uh, there we go. Can you see the PowerPoint? Fabulous. Um, okay, so uh, you know, my first decision for a title for the um, the presentation was, you know, what does you know traffic lights have to do with voting? But then I just went for a more general a more general title. I will say that I sing musicals. I don't sing them well. That's just what I do. Is I I just it brings me joy. Um, so I wanted to talk about traffic lights, and then I was just like. You know, um, uh, the amazing women of um, of Monthly Cycle said, will you, will you come and talk? And I said, look, five minutes, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about traffic lights. Why? I had to make five minutes sexy. Uh, but I wanted also to kind of like bring one issue and maybe from that issue, look and, and, and look at it from a systemic or an intersectional way and an intersectional analysis. So I'm just going to give you the issue that we dealt with as the Cork Cycling Campaign and then what are the things that I would like to consider or maybe the questions that I would like people could, to, you know, to ask themselves when we're looking at infrastructure and it's not only when it, we're looking at traffic lights but other types of infrastructure when it comes to cycling. So the context is Cork obviously, capital. Um, so we found that 99 sets of traffic lights um, here in Cork City were sensor activated but they, they didn't detect people on bikes. So they have the capability but they didn't, but they needed modifications. So um, it, one of the issues is, so basically you get to the traffic light and you could there be for an hour, you know, you could be there for an hour and it won't change because you're on a bike, a car comes, goes green. Now, this is in the context also of uh, the fixed charge notices for breaking a red light. So that is 40 euro on the spot uh, fine that, that you could be liable for, it, you know, breaking a red light. Um, and also in the context of COVID-19. So when we wrote to the council, um, there were fewer cars, so you know you could be waiting for a car forever. Um, there's reduced bus capacity, and, and there is government advice to cycle if you can. So, what we did about it is in April of this year, we highlighted this with the executive here in Cork City Council, and we said, look, it's unreasonable that you're you know punishing us because these lights don't detect us. Um, you know, we would be risking fines for breaking red lights when there's no, uh, you know, no, no realistic expectation that they're going to change for us. And, you know, look, there's social distancing, you know, we're meant to be to be moving, we're meant to not be in, you know, in, in buses or on cars if possible. So we asked them, look, can you please modify these lights? In the meantime, can you fit regulatory uh, signs just telling people who are cycling to yield? Because at this point, you know, that would give an exit um, to people who are there in front of a red light. And look, if it's a yield, you look very careful, uh, carefully and then you just cross. Apparently, we've been told this is apparently not allowed under road legislation. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see that now. Um, and then in the long term, we did ask them, look, can you fit these lights with advanced traffic bike lights so that we don't have to, um, you know, have people in cars and patients because we're not maybe advancing as, as fast as they would like us to be. So in September of this year, we heard from the director of services that they submitted an application for funding. I'm not really sure to whom. I don't have an answer to that yet. But if it's to the NCA, Finola, Finola, please put in a good word for us, just for us to get money to, to fix our traffic lights. That would be great. Um, but it, you know, the bigger question is, what does it have to do with inclusion? So I guess when, and, and as I said, this is not only about traffic lights, and I want us to think about all of the other barriers, but we'll take traffic lights this time. So what are the options that we have when a traffic light doesn't respond to, you know, to us, to our presence as people who are cycling? So the first option is wait, you know, sure, why don't you wait? And here's when we look at the situation of being on a bike and how stopping and, and you know, having barriers there increase risks for people. And it's, this is everyone who cycles, but also I just want us to consider maybe how does that affect um, other people it specifically or maybe deters them disproportionately from taking on cycling so here and look I, I think I was listed as talking about race and migration but to me these all of these things are connected because you know look I am brown I'm a migrant now I'm Irish but you know, and I'm a woman you know so like these um, these identities can intersect. So when we're talking about race, when we're talking about migration and visible religious minorities, like we, we, we did see, and I have some clippings here for very real issues that have happened. Um, a lot of the reporting is in Dublin, you know, look, these things happen in other places, but the media like Dublin. And so, you know, kind of like just, you know, to bring up here some of the issues, these are not about traffic lights necessarily, but you have seen how the barriers at the canals have made, you know, people have to stop and then they have to wrangle 
the those gates and things like that and how stopping could put one at added risk so you know the string of attacks in the grand canal but also there was this story about um, uh, Mohammed and Jamal who had stopped at a traffic light and they were speaking in Arabic and then they were just suddenly attacked and I don't know about you but when I learned to drive I remember my father said look if you're in a red light and you're on your own and there's nothing coming you just go through because of the danger that was associated with being stationary and that was in a car so when we are talking about um, the issue of stopping there what are the added risks and what are the other the added fears that some sections of the population might have and then you know it is about you know women but also i was just thinking look it's, it is about also about gender identity sexual orientation it could be you know um you know it, because of how we present ourselves and how we exist in the world we do face more risks and we have seen it in terms of hate crimes and things like that so so we have to think about these things when we are talking about mobility um, so, you know, Louise Williams who is chairing here, so there, we, we have had so many articles and so many pieces about the intimidation, about the attacks or about the confrontations that are forced because of these things. So when we are forced to stop at certain places or to be confronted with other users, um, it, there is more opportunity for aggression, be it physical or, you know, or verbal. So I think, um, Julina had this tweet here and I asked her for, for her permission to have it here and, and she was talking about um, you know how she was presented in this situation when someone overtook her very close she said look you did this and she was told um, she was shouted out you know fucking foreigner go home you fucking foreigner so it does come with that you know when you are a person of color when you are a migrant what are these fears that we might have and that I might have um, when confronting people and when being forced to confront or to share spaces when we really shouldn't and, and I think this is maybe highlighting what Finola was saying in terms of how many of us would like segregation to prevent these things from happening uh, but then also if we go back there there is an issue there in terms of precarious work and I cannot think of any more precarious work right now than um, people who are a self-employed as delivery um, as delivery cyclists in in our cities many of them are migrants many of them are people of color and as we do know there are these algorithms that you know give a premium if you do it faster and and you know there are these articles where they themselves have said look we feel pressured into taking these risks into breaking these lights into breaking these rules so when we have these barriers in movement when we make cycling slower it doesn't happen in a vacuum it happens in this context that we have here um, so then, you know, another option might be, sure, look, you don't have to break the lights, you don't have to wait, why don't you dismount? And I think this was an interesting one when we're talking about disability, you know, dismounting from a bike, it, it, it assumes that a person can dismount. So we see and we should be encouraging more people with disabilities who want to cycle and who are able to cycle um, to do so with the appropriate infrastructure. But for some of them, a bike is their mobility aid. So dismounting may not necessarily be an option. Um, and I think it also comes into how we stereotype cycling as, you know, oh, a person with a disability, sure, they couldn't be cycling. It's like, no, that's not the case. You know, many can, but won't because of how, what, how our infrastructure works. And I think uh, Finola's numbers were, were really good in terms of how that comes about. Um, and then we talk about breaking the lights. Okay, you know, look, no one's coming and you just jump that red light. And, and I, this is one of the issues that I always bring up when it comes to race and immigration status and being of a visible religious minority. All of this comes in a select, you know, in, in a context of selective policing. And I don't think I'm the first one to say that sometimes we do observe whether, you know, like not necessarily on purpose that policing and enforcement is done disproportionately in some, you know, to some populations than to others. And even if we do compare, you know, there's people parking on footpaths, but yet we are being stopped because we're not wearing a helmet. You know, one, one thing is regulated and the other one isn't. So, you know, the selective policing is an issue and also the use of discretion. So how someone, um, might be just let go and sure look you just don't do it again but others might be told no you are getting fined or you are having you know you're you're you know you're going to court for whatever traffic offense and and here i'm, I'm plugging the police podcast where i talked about um policing and how it, they, it interacts with immigration um and it's, it's just really important in terms of if we are 
by design, by infrastructure, forcing people to either wait or dismount, or in this case, break the lights, because that's the more, possibly the most logical thing to do if the traffic lights are not gonna change for you. People who are migrants in this country are exposed to being charged for an offense that then would have an impact on renewing their immigration status or even accessing citizenship. Again, this is all in the context of, you know, the Department of Justice not having guidance over how good character is considered. So it, there, there is such a thing as driving while migrant or driving while brown or walking while black, you know, like it is very unclear how these, what we would consider small traffic offenses might be considered for someone who is going for a citizenship application. And then again, this goes on to the bigger thing. And I know I, I do go into the, the bigger picture, you know, one, having um, a barrier to accessing citizenship means no access to public jobs and not being able to vote. So there are people who are now being prevented from accessing citizenship and exercising a vote uh, because they might have a couple of traffic offences and it could be, you know, jumping a red light on a bike or a parking offence, things that many people who can vote have done and will keep on doing and it won't necessarily have the same impact on them. So. I guess in, in, in this, I hope I'm not running over time too much, so this is my last slide. Um, so I guess whenever I'm talking about mobilities and whenever I'm talking about infrastructure, is I, I do ask that we look at the infrastructure with the context in mind, that the mobilities don't exist in a vacuum, that when we are talking, like it, it is about traffic lights and it is about gates and it is about not having cycling lanes and it is about all of these things that we see um, as infrastructure problems, but how does it affect people who are not your necessarily your, you know, white male settled person, you know, in terms of race, how does it affect people in, in when there is racism, when there is xenophobia, when there is Islamophobia, putting people at risk, but also being, you know, experiencing the world in systems that have racism going through them. When we're talking about infrastructure for cycling and how important cycling is for people who are migrants, I always remind people, I, had, I have been driving for 10 years, but I had to do 12 mandatory lessons, that's 500 euro, you know, people who are in deprivation or people who are undocumented, they cannot even access a driving license. So when we are not uh, investing in public transport and in cycling infrastructure, people in deprivation are undocumented, they can't even drive. So those are, you know, we're making it, less accessible, we're making the world less accessible to them. Then when we're talking about sex and gender and identity, you know, look, a traffic light, seeing someone who's on a bike, it's not going to resolve the issues of sexual, sexual harassment or, you know, sexism in the streets, but it, you know, it is in that context that it happens. When we talk about disability or health status or age, you know, there is ableism, you know, we have to see that some people, because of their disability or because of their health, their health, they do not have access to a driving license. Um, and even when we look at studies here in Ireland, the TILDA study that looks at people who are getting older in Ireland, so many of them, as they're getting older, people with intellectual disabilities report moving and they are moving not autonomously, but they have a member of their family or a member of staff driving them. So it's even the freedom that we are taking from people with disabilities, in that case with intellectual disabilities, from moving in the world autonomously. Um, and you know, look, the, you know, there are these things about precarious employment and how all of these things work in that. And, and looking at, you know, I think the people, um, I, I just have to say it again, the people who work in precarious employment are largely, you know, in, while cycling, are largely migrant, are largely people of colour. So when we are saying that the cycling infrastructure is just for middle-aged, you know, middle-class white men, we are leaving behind this, you know, this population that seem to be forgotten again and again and again, you know. Um, so I guess that, that's my general ask. Uh, and then the other secondary is please give us money for traffic lights in Cork. Um, but yeah, so that, you know, look, whenever we're talking about mobilities, it's just looking at these things and looking at who we are excluding. When we don't make cycling safe, we are basically forcing people into having cars, which are just, you know, not cheap to have. And some people can't even access a driving license. And, and this is something that we are forcing through our infrastructure. Um, you know, so I hope that wasn't too much of a ramble. Um, thank you so much. Great. 
thank you so much, Maho. Um, and there's lots of comments coming in to the chat function um, and we'll get to some of those um, and we've got more speakers to come. Um, I did mention at the beginning that I might have to kind of cut through um, because we've got the Minister for Transport, Eamon Ryan, has joined us. Thank you, Minister, for coming on. Hi, Louise. Hi, how are you? Good. Sorry, I'm late. I was stuck in a Brexit meeting. It's the way of the world these days. But it's all sorted now. Not a problem. So you know, we got we got Boris sorted, and yeah. I wish. Yeah. Okay. Listen, no, we really appreciate. It. I mean, this is this is organised by monthly cycles. This get together. It's part of Bike Week. It's part of the um, our longer process within mon monthly cycles, where we're really kind of bringing a focus on um, inclusion uh, and access to public space. So we we're delighted that you joined us. Like it really is a, a pleasure. Um, and I might fire you a quick question if you have time for it. Uh, yeah, of course. Move on to other speakers. Um, so, Minister, like we've already heard from Fanola in, in the NTA about the Bike Life Survey, which I'm sure you know. Um, and we've also speaking, been listening to Evie talking about the challenges facing uh, accessing public transport in West Cork. Um, you know, we know there's a huge inequality in, in you know who gets to cycle, who feels safe cycling, those perceptions of safety, and um, who feels safe accessing public space and navigating public space. So, you know, obviously we've got this immense rupture with COVID um, and it's transforming the way we think about our public space and the way we plan our transport. If you, if you could talk to us a little bit about how we could integrate these principles of inclusion and justice into how we spend our money, how we plan. Um, could you talk a little bit about that point? Yeah, can I give some background, I suppose, because um, I've been thinking about this for a while. Uh, I, I got involved first in the, well, there was a bunch of us helped set up the Dublin Cycling Campaign back in the early 90s. And it was at a time when it was still that history that tail end of a historic kind of cycling culture but it was dying in its feet and dying too in the accidents being killed by by trucks particularly turning left it was always the historic so we got involved in the cycling campaign and and um one of the things that struck me i became a councillor five or six no seven years later and i always remember the statistic that jumped out to me that in i'm talking about my own city now dublin city council at the time, and it's still not that different in the city. I think it was, I think I'm, I'm going on memory, but about 50% of households didn't own a car. And on that first and foremost principle, I was kind of thinking we're spending all the money on roads and we're spending all the money on the assumption that people have private cars and, and half of the people in our city don't own a car. What are we doing? Why are we spending all the money on them? And, and investing in cycling infrastructure and on public transport and cycling and walking it um it, it is i always thought it's a social policy issue it's it's an issue of uh, bringing more and more equal so city and society on that basic principle that you got to be well off still relatively to own a car and that people don't think that but but that's the truth you'd never know that if you look at advertising on television and so on you think it's natural everyone has a car they don't a lot of families particularly in council flats or others don't have a car. The other second thing I always think, if I can, just a few thoughts from my own personal experience, and this is experience as a cyclist, in terms of this social aspect of it. One of the things that I love about cycling is that actually you can see and be seen. People, it's actually social in the sense that it, you can, people, you're not in a box, you're, you're visible. And you can relatively easily stop. You don't have to get a parking place. You can pull over to the side of the road and stop. So it's a quintessentially social uh, transport system because you wave at people as you go by or you nod at people or if you see someone you know and you want to talk to them, you just stop. And, and that's not an insignificant change to the nature of social interaction in a city, and in a, uh, I think, and not unimportant. Thirdly, just as a... Well, that what, what we just heard there about safety and about I think there's a great freedom in cycling in the sense that if you're in a difficult area or maybe if you are feel vulnerable, you a woman or migrant or whatever, even uh, whatever reason, there is this actually certain security that comes that you can still get away on a bike. You can actually accelerate away from if you like, don't like the look of someone on a street, feels a bit uncomfortable. 
it is actually a secure form of transport in the sense that you're quicker than someone who's, who's going to maybe try and give you a hassle. Or you have that sense of being moving on and, and not being someone, you know, someone doesn't easily stop you if, if you don't want to stop. And that's that's hugely significant, I think, in terms of making the city feel safer. And, and um, um, yeah, and I think it's a really good point. Um, uh, unless there's a traffic light says Maho, but I think it is a really good point. And, and a lot of women do say that to us that they would feel safer cycling home than walking home at night, for example. Having said that, there are areas that women can avoid, tend to avoid, maybe because of lighting and due to other kind of access issues. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, over the years, that's some of the reasons I've been campaigning. I think at this moment in time with COVID, uh, we have a transformation point and we should use it. It's a, occurring in a whole variety of different ways. People's connection to the local environment changed during the lockdown where they were constrained to two kilometres of their area. That created a new sense of understanding of local area. The need for us to switch on cycling and walking because our public transport capacity is limited is seeing what happened in Dunleary and what I'm hoping will happen in other parts in Dublin City Council's happened on the North Keys and so on, where we were able to put in temporary measures. That's a fundamental shift. Um, but also there's a fundamental shift in terms of the big commute, the idea that everyone always drives every day of the week in and out of work. That's gone. Now it's not gone, but it, we're not going to go back to five day a week, everyone. We're going to go back to probably three or four day a week, maybe, but who knows, but it'll be much more flexible. And I think it will bring back to the importance of connection in the local area, local village, local town, local community. And that actually strengthens the case and the strength or the arguments for cycling. So people will know and government were, were kind of, um, we got a commitment to the program for government to, we took the OECD recommendation that it should be 20% of the budget should go to walking and cycling. And we got a commitment to that. So I'm in the middle of the budget process at the moment. And we think we calculate, I can't put exact figures at 360 million or something needs to go on walking and cycling and, and, and we'll deliver that. And we'll deliver it year in, year out so that build up assets and, and infrastructure over time. Um, and it has to be everywhere. It can't just be Dublin and, and it has to be Cork, Galway, Waterford, Limerick and every town and every village and rural area. And um, it's doable. And and um, I've been saying this for a long time. When I started campaigning back in the early 90s, my poor now wife, then girlfriend, kind of, she was sick and tired of me saying, mark my words, Dublin's about to change. We're about to see it turning into Cycling City. And after 25 years of it not happening, I was kind of, she was getting, the, that was a bit of a joke in our house. But actually, I think Dublin's about to change. It's going to become a cycling city. We're going to really do this. And it's going to be at scale and radical and improve the life and conditions for all the people, but particularly those people who can't afford a car. Yeah. And uh, there's some really interesting, I think you've raised a lot of really interesting points that, um, and I think there are a lot of questions that at this rupture, at this kind of turning point that we're facing and um, that with the NTA research into uh, perceptions of cycling. It's also about kind of exploring um, people seeing themselves as cyclists and making sure that it doesn't become a kind of a middle class way of, of, of getting around and it doesn't, we don't create mobility elites, but we create, um, you know, with Bus Connects, with the other various pub, uh, uh, mobility plans that are being rolled out that we could create, you know, that we have at the heart of what we're doing, ideas of justice and social equality. And that's, I guess, from a kind of a monthly cycles point of view, that's one of the, the main things that we want to raise. We're going to be publishing some research and really talking about um, how to make sure that inclusion is at the heart of how we plan our transport. So it's brilliant to hear you talking about in such a positive way about this point that we're at. I think it's really, it's really is a critical point. Um, for creating, uh, for really transforming it. And it's, it's your wife is happy, you're happy. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 I don't know if she's happy, but <laughs> with me. But, well, uh, you finally, you know, it finally came through in a certain sense. And it's just perhaps um, a moment where we can also just make sure that that spending is done in a very equal way. In, uh, so as not to create routes which are only used in certain sections of Dublin, but that all sections of Dublin can, can be mobile. Yeah, it has to be everywhere. And I have to be careful because I think I am the middle class, middle aged male is probably qualifying all three counts. Uh, and uh, and I'm part of the picture, too. And, and that's a good thing in my suit flying around. Um, 
Can I say one thing just on, on access, a disability access? I, I was very fortunate in the mid 90s, I was appointed to the Dublin Transportation Office Advisory Committee and I got to know a lot of the traffic and engineers then. And they're good people. Uh, a lot of the decisions, the bad decisions we made in recent years wasn't necessarily because we didn't know the right thing to do. I'd be honest, I think it was political. Um, and I could go into that for a long time as to why politically we didn't do what we knew we have, ha, should be doing for 20 plus years. But I remember John Henry was the head of the Dublin Transportation Office in the time I was there and I thought he was a great engineer and we do need engineers in this because it's an engineering issue in terms of how you allocate space and, and, and was, um, manage this transport system. But he had a principle which was in everything he applied it, you look at access, disability access first, you look at the the most vulnerable kind of road user, but, and it was, it, and that by doing that by design, you end up with really good transport system for everyone was the axiom. And, and, and that applied to when we were putting the Lewis in, make sure it's absolutely accessible, make sure that it's, it's top of the range, all the stations are properly accessible and so on. And what you find when you do that, you say, okay, design for a wheelchair user, which you do need to do, but actually it applies for, for someone with a buggy and children. It applies for someone maybe who's older, it applies for someone and, and maybe special needs and whatever, whole variety of different ways. And, and also for everyone, it makes for a better designed system. And I think it's the same now when we're doing cycling infrastructure. We, we do have to think of the pedestrian. We do have to think of, of because they're the start, everyone is pedestrian. And, and we do need to think about speed in that way. And we need to think about you know, what type of cycling, what culture, is it all Lycra? And I'll be honest, I'm scared a lot of the time at the moment by cyclists overtaking me. As I'm getting older, I'm getting slower. And I kind of suddenly, I kind of, you know, people are squeezing by me and way it's got, if they were six inches closer to me, they'd clip my handlebar and I'd be in trouble here now. Mm -hmm. So I do think our design concept around what type of cycling city is it's for the very young, it's for the very old, it's for the very, not very slow, but it, it, it has to the room for the slow so that yep. so that we, we apply that design axiom. And, and we, we design it in such a way that all the different routes can join up and that they can park in, in facilities that suit them. Um, one of our participants this evening is the author of Mobility Justice, which is a wonderful book, The Politics of Movement in the Age of Extremes. Um, Mimi Scheller, um, she's listening in. Um, and we, we are delighted to have her along. But I think Mimi has made a really good point that I've just... Um, Mimi makes the point, uh, Minister, principles of mobility justice, uh, echoing what you say, often call for including a range of people in decision making and policy planning to help make sure we don't lock in middle class mammal perspectives again. Many engineers are working from a middle class masculine perspective as well. And Evie, um, thanks for your comment as well. When we look after the most vulnerable, everybody benefits. And that's a brilliant point to make. Minister, will you stay with us and, and keep yeah. listening? Okay, yeah. excellent. You're very welcome. And I, 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 you can see some of the comments coming in as well. Um, so thanks very much for, for taking part. You're very welcome. Um, and it's been great to have your, your perspective. I'm going to move on to our next panelist. Um, Joan O'Connell uh, is with us. Um, so Joan is, is the brains and the machine behind Monthly Cycles. She does an extraordinary job organizing this and she really is what makes it happen every month. Um, she lives in Dublin and over the years her work and volunteering has involved human rights and equality themes including work with young LGBTI people, refugees in Ireland, she's worked in a human rights NGO, the National Human Rights Institution. Um, she's led a Yes Equality constituency group during the marriage equality referendum, and she currently works in data protection. And she's going to talk to us this evening. Joan, are you ready? No. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll uh, present my screen as well if I can. I'll try and see if this will work. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so nice bright red screen for me today. So yeah, I'm, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much uh, to everybody who's tuned in and is watching. I know there's like dozens of people watching, which is wonderful. Um, thank you also to each of the panelists who've been volunteering their time and expertise um, and to Louise as well for chairing and to Janet, who's been organizing and bringing together all these brilliant and amazing people uh, for this evening's webinar. Um, so I'm just going to switch off my video so everyone can see my screen. Uh, so hopefully that's working well. 
Um, so just to briefly talk about this evening, I have about five minutes. So I'll try to keep to the time, Louise. Um, so basically monthly cycles, as Louise mentioned at the start, we're a Dublin-based initiative and our aim is to bring people together, primarily women, although not exclusively, uh, but uh, primarily women for an inclusive cycle around the city each, each month. And that's basically what it comes down to on our, on our monthly regular activities. Um, but more than anything, these are social events. Um, so they're intended to be a social event primarily, but then there's also the added bonus of exploring the city, getting on your bike, sharing experiences, exchanging tips maybe, and very importantly, enjoying cake. Um, so as mentioned at the start, it is myself. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and coordinators, but that's along with Janet, Anya and Louise. So it's a, it's a kind of a team effort. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly today then or later on now about the beginnings, the aims and the activities of monthly cycles and sort of what the future plans are. Um, as Louise mentioned at the start, we've been kind of a, a year on the go now. So we're kind of looking at, at what's next. Um, so let me see if I can get to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to start off kind of to talk a little bit about the beginnings. Um, so how we how we started. Basically, this is kind of a, a nice people centered view of cities. It's a very kind of um, well known um, look at how cities might be better envisaged nowadays amongst people who might be considered to be urbanists. Um, Jan Gell is a very, very famous individual and this was a tweet that was posted recently by a, a council official. And it struck me because it's, it's obviously a very meaningful, uh, well intended thing to say. But the thing that struck me about it was that, this is what I tweeted later on, was saying that basically uh, this man, Jan Gell, who's a very people centered approach to, to looking at cities, his idea really came from his wife. And we never really hear much about her, Ingrid. Uh, Ingrid Gell came up with the idea, she's a behavioral psychologist, and in the 1960s, way back when we were still in the post-war car-centered world, she said, well, why are you know, planners and architectures, ar architects not looking at people and not centering people in their view of how cities are formed and planned? Um, so that kind of just struck me because it's a very well-intentioned thing. It's something I agree with, putting people at the center of how we look at cities and make them livable but always the focus is on him and not her. And it's just, it just kind of illustrated for me a kind of way in which people are erased or they're rendered invisible or people are kind of missing from the picture. Because really, what kind of city is it if it's, if it's all about Jan and the men and the middle class people and we don't have anyone else included up, um, as part of that? Um, so just very briefly, um, this is just some of the stats I think that Fanola had in her um, presentation earlier. These are taken from the NTA bike life report. Um, so as I said, our primary aim in monthly cycles is really about, it's around inclusion and diversity. So although kind of our, our events are very much social, they're lighthearted, they're, you know, a gentle cycle around the city, there is actually kind of a, an underlying aim around doing that. So inclusion and diversity and active travel and public space is kind of where we're at, or as Fanola put it earlier as well, the politics of space. So who gets to decide how the space is shaped, who gets to use that space, is it safe, is it not safe, and so on. And what we're looking at, uh, or certainly my understanding of what we're looking at um, in relation to inclusion and diversity, is we're looking at things through a human rights framework. Um, so we're looking at the ideas of equality and anti-discrimination uh, from a kind of a, a very much um, a human rights promotion angle. And so that's why partly the monthly cycles um, was set up. We, we met about a year ago at a, a women's cycling event, essentially, but there's a lot broader, uh, a lot of a broader conceptualization in, in, as I see it, in relation to how we want to be inclusive in, in cycling. Um, so as was borne out by those statistics, there's a huge amount of people who are underrepresented when it comes to cycling and more generally active travel as well. Uh, sorry, I'll just go back there. Um, so we want to drill down, you know, we can drill down further into the reasons why that is, but basically public space, cycling, planning, and so on is still quite dominated by your average white middle-class man. So who is not represented in those decision-making roles, in advocacy, in the day-to-day -day when you're outside and you're looking at people cycling, the crowds that are mostly made up of men. Um, and what are the things that are keeping out of public space? So we're talking about safety, we're talking about sexism, homophobia, racism, but also things about road safety as well. So the violence in the road, the, the dangers that might be perceived or in fact inherent in going out on the street. Okay, uh, let me see if I can move on to the next slide here. 
I'm giving the game away there. Um, okay. So just to talk about, these are, that was sort of the, the underpinning really of where we're coming from when it comes to monthly cycles. The activities themselves, I said, as I said, they're quite, you know, they're quite leisurely, they're relaxed, they're informal. Um, we go on little cycles around the, the city, on the streets, in parks. We always sit down and have a nice cup of tea. It's all very relaxed and it's, it's meant to be, it's intended to be that way. It's meant to be enjoyable. And we're, the idea is as well that we, we meet different people from different walks of life. So it's a way to build participation and through that to build inclusion. And it's also a way of maybe um, boosting people's confidence. So you'd have some nervous cycler, somebody who's new to cycling, who might be, feel more comfortable going along in a group. Um, and it's sort of maybe, you could call it an informal peer support maybe through sharing experiences, tips, stories, and just that kind of moral support of being together in a group. Um, and then also partly the, the motivation there is to kind of gain ownership of public space and kind of claim or reclaim that space. Um, because when you have maybe a group of people cycling, a large vehicle like this might be more inclined to give way and, and overtake more safely. Um, as well as the activities of meeting up every month, uh, we also have, as Louise mentioned, our research and advocacy. We want to kind of identify gaps in the research and practice, again, to sort of maybe shift away from certain focus or traditional ways of looking at planning and city, uh, city planning and um, how to look at cycling and traffic management and look at incorporating ideas around sexism, accessibility, racism, and so on from that human rights framework as well. Um, so we also want to kind of reach out to others. Um, as you can see, what are our future plans? We want to reach out to others through those meetings, through events like this. And as you can see from that last photo, that last series of photos, there is still a lot of work that we need to do ourselves. We need to be quite self-reflective on what we're doing. Um, so in those photos, you could see most of, uh, most of us there were white. Quite a lot of us are kind of middle class. So there's something kind of like maybe the mismatch there that we need to work on still. We need to see why are we maybe not as representative. We might have some people of color come to our, our groups, but not a huge amount. It's still dominated by, by people who are white and from certain backgrounds. So we need to look at why that is and why not and be able to develop and learn and grow and change and to see what we need to do to address ourselves. Because it's, it's, it's all very well to sort of tell other people what they should be doing, but we also need to be able to put that into practice ourselves. So, um, so as I said, we are the organizers ourselves. We're, we're white, middle-class, able-bodied women. We need to, to look at changing that ourselves. Um, most of our participants have been white and able-bodied, although not all. Um, but again, we need to revisit that perhaps and try and reach out more to, to local groups, community groups perhaps, and, and get people on board um, and really more, be more proactive in how we engage with people. And the idea would be to reach out and find out ourselves, you know, who is interested, who is not, why and why not, who wants to engage with our kind of activities and do what works and change what isn't quite right for us. And we need to be the ones to educate ourselves and do the work and learn from others as well. So we need to kind of be very um, proactive on that. So that's kind of one of the things that I think uh, the monthly cycles group ourselves need to do. And then that will in, in turn inform the advocacy and the work that we do as well. So hopefully we'll be able to learn from the experience of other groups here in Ireland, but also there's similar groups that exist over in the UK and the USA and elsewhere. So we can learn from that and, and grow and change. And based on these learnings then encourage more people to join our events and wider work as well. So I'm hoping it'll kind of turn into a bit of a virtuous circle. Um, so that's just a little overview on our origins, who we are, what we're kind of about, what, what drives us, I guess, in, in um, our, the, the work that we're doing and why we're doing it and what our kind of overall aims are. Um, so I hope that's quite all right. We are online if you need to, to find out a little bit more about what we've been up to or, or uh, some of the, the um, background about us. Uh, so monthly.bike, that's actually our web, web address. And then we're Monthly Cycles on Facebook and on Twitter as well. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that was a, a little crash course in Monthly Cycles, but hopefully it was helpful for you all. And inviting. Um, <laughs> uh, and we will get back into you know, going out and about um, as soon as we're, as restrictions allow us. Um, thanks, Emily and Joan. Um, so do follow us on social media and keep it, keep up to speed with what's going on. Yeah. So um, I'm going to turn to two more people who are involved in the monthly cycles. Janet Horner is a Green Party councillor from Dublin's North Inner City, and she's just been appointed chair of the Walking and Cycling Committee, which is great. Congratulations, Janet. Um, and Janet is co-founder of Monthly Cycles. And also Onya Tuberty is a panellist as well, and she's been keeping an eye on the chat um, and she's going to be 
be sharing questions and comments. Um, Anya is also a friend of Muncie Cyclists and is helping out with the research project. So I might uh, hand to you, Janet, maybe to start and maybe to sort of wrap up some of, some of what we've heard this evening, if that's okay. Yeah, thanks so much. So I don't really have an awful lot to add to this. I just sort of wanted to, um, it's just been really brilliant to, to sort of help bring some of this together. And it's a discussion that, um, on, that I think we've been having, particularly among uh, a particular group of us a lot over the last little while, um, about sort of how important it is that we, we do look at the issues of um, inclusion, intersectionality within our sort of um, transport spaces. I think a lot of us, when we used first started talking about monthly cycles, we were kind of coming at it as different, um, um, particularly like different feminist lenses that we sort of brought to different areas of our work and really wanted, really could see the issues. We could see the cycling. For us, it was cycling, but we could also kind of look around and see the wider issues of our public space and could see that there are very clear gender issues at play, race issues at play, ableist issues at play, and we really wanted to, um, we, we, could, we could see that, we just couldn't quite see what needed to be done, and we wanted to start kind of having those conversations a little bit more and bringing together that sort of thing. And for me, um, as I'm just starting taking the, the, up the role then as chair of the Walking and Cycling Committee for Dumb City Council, and I'm really looking forward to, to doing that. I think one of the main things that, and this, is a, this, is, this conversation is a key part of that, is to really break down some of the dichotomies that we present ourselves with, where we say, well, I'm, I'm a young mother who wants to get my children to school, so I have to drive because it's the only safe way for me to do so. So I need, I need investment in roads, I need to protect my parking spaces, versus I'm, you know, young and able-bodied and I, I like to cycle as fast as I can through the city, um, you know, and, 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 and everybody else needs to, needs to get out of my way. Um, and sometimes it, I think that when we look at it, what we've taken from our feminist backgrounds is a little bit of saying, well, actually, if we say, if we look at the public sector duty, which says everybody has, has um, uh, we shouldn't be, do everyone has rights in, in, in public space and through public bodies and um, that we take a kind of human rights based approach, children's rights based approach, women's rights based approach to, to public space and to public amenities, um, whether there are roads or our cycle lanes or what they might be, that we say that it actually prompts us to deliver a very, um, um, very different, very more, much more inclusive approach to transport and it breaks down some of those those kind of dichotomous arguments that we tend to find ourselves in a little bit so i think yeah it's just been really really great sorry i I'm not too sure about any any particular oh just oh they have one note here it says say thank you to joan because it is <laughs> it is a, a year that we've been organizing our monthly cycles and joan has done an absolutely phenomenal job of organizing them every month um, and we are growing and it is moving and it's really great so we haven't been able we were going to have a celebratory cycle we didn't get to do that but this is our this is one of our celebrations for for having a year and seeing a lot of kind of the conversations shifting over that year as well so we're really delighted and just say huge thank you to Joan, huge thank you to Louise for chairing this evening, huge thank you to everybody else for participating. I think we're going to do q and I'm going to hand back to Louise to do that, so I'm not, we're not wrapping up, I'm just, I just want to say my thanks. <laughs> yeah, I was just about to say don't wrap up yet, because we did, we, did, we did say that we would come to the questions and comments, and Anya has um, been, been kind of keeping an, an eye on them, so if you wanted to go, Anya. Yeah, so it seems as though something that's resonated with a couple of the attendees is this idea of getting new voices and new perspectives into decision making and um, whether that's school children who have something to say about those cars outside of their their school or um, putting that little bit more effort into actually going around and knocking on people's doors to hear what they have to say and um, so I wonder if any of the panelists would like to add to that idea of how, how can we get these voices in? How can we take these steps to, to broaden the conversation? If anyone would like to come in on that. <laughs> Maho, I think yeah. you're- um, Look, I guess I just really want, you know, 
part of the thing that always annoys me about when we talk about what we're going to do as a city, as a country, is that there seems to be this obsession with who can vote, which is great. But there are, you know, there are massive sectors of the population who can vote. And yes, I'm usually talking about the migrants, non-UK migrants who cannot vote in general elections. But it's like everyone who's under 18 is actually incredibly affected by our mobilities. And when I am talking about, you know, like that there's people who can't afford or are not allowed to drive, you know, and it might be some people with epilepsy, some people with some disabilities, people who are undocumented and direct provision, under 18s are a massive part of the population. And I do think that, you know, as policy and also as advocacy bodies, we need to do more to engage with them. And I have been thinking, like, if only I didn't work a nine to five job, what can we do to to make it better in terms of asking them what they want and giving them a voice when we are talking about the cork cycling campaign you know it shouldn't be the you know over 18 cork cycling campaign and i think that's something that us as advocacy groups can and should be doing now all public representatives i think you know should be engaging as well with with those who cannot vote for them including the the under 18s uh, as well but i do think you know from the position where i am as a campaign member I think it is a mea culpa that we need to, you know, bring to ourselves, how can we engage? And that might be going with cards or, you know, going to schools or talking in scout groups and, and spaces like that where young people congregate um, so that we can get their views. And, you know, they might not be able to vote, but their voices need to be heard. So, you know, I think at least the advocacy groups, we can and we should be doing more there as well. Um, but, uh, you know, look, consultations, when we're having CMATS consultations, it's whoever can get online on a computer and look at these charts that I cannot understand. And I'm like, I have a degree or two, you know. So when we look at accessibility as well, who are we excluding by the way that we run these very narrow ways of consultations when we are doing these things? And that's why I think that the, the, the approach that they had and Don Louis Don wrote down was really good. Uh, in terms of you try it, you test it, and that's something that 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 is more accessible to people who wouldn't otherwise be able to um, have access to the normal consultation proceedings uh, that are you know online on a computer and, and looking at these very complex things. So you know, trial is is also something that we can and should be doing. It's public people. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, so I'm going to move on to another question which has come in around um, the actual kind of material facilities to get on a bike, to, to use infrastructure and to cycle. Um, specifically, this is relating to um, the, the cycling um, facilities that people with disabilities need um, to get around from A to B. So we know that, for instance, um, the cycle to work scheme here in Ireland, um, it's very narrowly about people who go to work and pay tax. And we know that people with disabilities face an extra barrier, extra costs in getting on a bike. So this question is specifically for the minister and wanting to know um, how we can um, how we can widen access to um, bicycles for people with disability, um, which are can be used by them. So I'll put that to you. Yeah, no, we're we're looking at that. And I think um, in a variety of ways, I think uh, one of the, the move towards electric, including electric vehicles, which may sometimes can help them, and not just people with disabilities, but also people and including that raising the threshold, which then also includes the possibility of other kind of less standard bikes, more three wheel and other kind of a range of other different cargo type bikes and other bikes that are more stable and 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 uh, um, so I think that is that is something we're looking at. I don't know whether we'll get it in time for this year's budget or whether maybe we'll try and get it in the finance bill, but it's something we're looking to do and and expand as well it from being a bike to work scheme to being a kind of more bike to college or a bike for life type scheme rather than just a bike to work scheme. So that is um, that's one of the things we're looking to try and do. I think it's in the John. If you remind me, because it's in, or it's in the program for government. I think, and, and I was a member of whether there is a firm commitment to it. But but my understanding that is something that that's that's agreed, and and we will deliver. Yeah, I think we've. I think it's commitment to expanding it. So I think one of the things that would be really brilliant is to see um, e-bikes and kind of recognizing that bikes a lot of time as mobility aids are sort of. Um, 
and to be kind of categorized a little bit differently and to, to so there's a commitment as, as I remember in the program for government to expand the bike to work scheme to make it more inclusive particularly of e-bikes um, but I think then there's also we I, I'd certainly be hopeful that we might be able to, to get a little bit more expansive again still and and as you say kind of look at um, children and, and look at kind of people who maybe fall a little bit outside of the PRSI system for various reasons and of course mm. um, do you know women as carers a lot of the time that they, they can sometimes not be in the in the PRSI system as much and, and that that's that that may be one of the reasons we see the the gender inequality well not the exclusive one but certainly it, it may be a contributing factor to the gender inequality we see in in cycling as well so that's something that would be um there's a lot of opportunity for reform in there so yeah it's certainly not a perfect scheme at the moment no thanks thanks for that input um so I think there's just one one other point um, that I might touch on if we have time. Um, so there's been a few comments um, throughout the evening on who are who are cycle lanes and new um, active mobility infrastructures mm -hmm. for. Um, we've touched on this point of mammals um, and um, where new cycle lanes go and um, who can access them. Um, so I just wanted to raise the point that has come up in the chat around um, kind of unequal access to these new infrastructures um, and how to avoid um, even gentrification, which they can lead to. So I wonder if anyone would like to, to touch on that. Can I make a point yeah. on you on that if I can, Eamon here? And I'm, yeah. going back, I'm going back on experience here now, going back a long time, as I said, in previous involved, much more active in cycling campaigning in the 90s. And at that time, there was a debate around whether we needed facilities at all. And I think at that time, there was kind of very particular, it was very male, really experienced, really high quality, you know, people who were well used to cycling were really kind of able to position themselves on the road in a really kind of, and at the time, there was really much, there was a case or a lot of movement within the cycling campaigns not to have any facilities. It was, I, I, it was kind of, um, it was strange, but, but I think that argument has changed. I think the very, the, the by segregation space and, 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 um, and creation, and even, I mean, I, I'd be honest, I'm nervous on some of the new facilities we're putting in where we're, there's ramps or, or small little um, um, concrete now, uh, pieces on the road and, and even some of the orcas and, and the other I kind of nervous that it makes it slightly it might makes it slightly difficult to cycle in some ways if I clip one of them or whatever I, I kind of are if, what happens if my wheel hits one of those um those little curbs they're putting in the middle of the road how will that work I, I, I'm nervous to see how this works but I, ultimately I do think it is the right decision to try and create this really safe space is because actually it's by definition, we are making a strategic decision in doing that to say we want to protect the more vulnerable cyclists. We want to make someone maybe who's, who's, who isn't as confident as someone who's super used to a bike to. So it is, I think, a strategic decision to broaden the, the, the possibility of cycling. And, and even if there are some risks and downsides in some of this infrastructure that I see now in terms of just it would be very interesting to see how does it work in real safety terms but actually i think it's still strategically the right thing because it does that argument was was made 20 30 years ago but it's, it's no longer the argument i think we're all agreed that that creating that wider constituency and creating that very safe space is the right thing to do okay thanks very much for that Oh, sorry, I think Fanola wanted from the NTA also wanted. Thanks, Minister. Um, I think Fanola wanted to respond as well, and then we, we're going to have to wrap up after after that. Yeah, I do see because I work with a lot of councils, like um, trying to promote cycle infrastructure through from Dunleary to South Dublin to Fingal, and there is there is a difference in, and it's 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 becoming clearer in the acceptability and the political kind of uh, uh, vision for. Uh, what what can what can be achieved and there is a more more of a nervousness probably in areas where there's a higher car dependency because they're not seen as money cyclists they're not you know they feel the risks are higher to disrupt traffic to do road space reallocation um and 
yeah, it, it, it is harder. We've seen a lot of protests at the same time as Dublin, as, as Dunleary have put in great infrastructure and have been allowed to by their councillors without public consultation, but with public kind of inter interventions uh, along the way through, via trials and stuff. I've, I've been dealing with a protest in, in Clondalkin that, you know, these people have been on the roundabout for a long time trying to get the two lanes back in and similar similar protests across Fingal and, and, and South Dublin. So it is interesting. It, it, like, how do we involve more? It, there is a kind of divide happening, I think. The idea of involving greater different communities, um, those that are less franchised, I think we really have to work harder on that. The Deliveroo community, the migrant communities, um, people that are, we can all see, are on bikes. And are on bikes not only in Clondalkin, but in Clonakilty. Um, and in, yeah, so I think, yeah, we do have to kind of franchise those people to at least start to talking about the discussion, uh, engaging them, because we, we're dealing with fear in a lot of cases. It cannot be underestimated, the fear of change. And I think there's a, there's a, over the course of my career, I've seen no, the, 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 the mobilization that happens now to protest against things um, happens so quickly happens without nuance, happens very quickly over social media and WhatsApp. And it can, it's a really debilitating factor in getting change in. And there's not that many that, you know, I, I, can, I can come up with 15, 16, all the different wedges I've been talking about, how we can engage communities and, and do early public consultation and stuff. But when you're up against that level of mobilization that has, that has come from fear, it's a big, big challenge. Like, and there's not that many like Dunleary that will trial at first like there's a, there's a lot of political bravery required there so yes back to your there is kind of an inequality happening we do need and actually from this discussion today i think that I'm, I'm more and more convinced that we need to be bringing in more voices because they are the ones affecting them that can bring positivity to this to the to the debate schools migrant populations the delivery population i hope they're all on whatsapp because i'd love to for them to <laughs> I'd love for them to be involved in, in, in public consultations a lot more. Other, thing, other like, people like that. And, and, and it, funny enough, on the gender side, what, what we're finding is it is that hard-pressed mother, usually, who's got very time poor, who is most vocally pro opposed to traffic reallocation because they, they feel that they just have no extra time in their lives. So all of the people that have been organising protests have been of that of that profile, which is very interesting and only occurred to me today when we were talking about it. So there are things like the, uh, the idea of, and, and they're the ones most likely never to, not to cycle and not see themselves as cyclists. I've uh, always, I hear from the people protesting, my husband's a cyclist. So he's the mama one that doesn't matter. It doesn't, that he doesn't need segregation. Like he's in, you know, um, but yeah. So um, yes, yeah, so, so yeah. What was I saying there? Wrapping it up. Um, point more out. people, more, 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 more engagement, more of those monthly cycles in areas like Clondalk and Anantala and in, yeah. we, and in, uh, and in Clonakilty and in, and in Swords, so that people start to see women and other types of like the other type cycling. As we do see it in the city centre, but yeah. you don't really see it in the suburbs or in the county towns and things. So, Shine, I think I've said a lot. I'm not sure if I can wrap it all up, but you know what I mean. And I'm going to make one point. I know Janet wants to jump in, but I do want to make a very brief point, which is, this is when we start to wrestle each other out of the way, but um, I think there is a duty, you know, it is a public sector duty to create facilities that don't discriminate, where equality is at the core. So when we're talking about all of these mobility options, you know, we do have a, a, a duty to look after that and to make sure that we're not creating... Um, we're not excluding people from using these services like that is you know at the core of the public sector duty and, and what it means so I think that is an important point um, but it's really I think it's really important that we also we identify the obstacles to consultation and we really kind of figure that out because just opening up a consultation and assuming everybody can, can participate is clearly not going to be happening especially when you've got the whatsapp groups that Fanola is discussing um, it's a really it's a really interesting one Janet do you want to we're going to wrap up Janet first and then, yeah. then I'm going to say thank you to everybody and wrap up and let you go and have your tea um, yeah, so I'll get my final word in, and if anybody, I'm sure there might be others fighting for a final word. But um, yeah, no, I think the I think the issue of um, 
this is where for us, I think one of the things we talk, like when we talk about the public sector duty, we talk about equality proofing, the transport interventions that we have. And I think when you look at um, what we're talking about there, kind of a pro, um, profile of a, a mother who is time poor and car dependent, um, pro, like protesting against changes in the reallocation of street space. I can understand that an awful lot because I think we don't see the, our transport system is been built around a kind of commuter model a lot of the time and it doesn't cater to the needs of um, women, children, people who are in their communities as much and, and those who might, um, our active transport policy again as we've mentioned even our, our main incentive for cycling is a bike to work scheme which is based on the kind of the idea that you're biking to work um, and that we're not, so I think so much of our transport has been around kind of getting people to and from the workplace and sometimes people have been left out of that so then they end up maybe in sort of more car dependent. And, and so I think the issue of visibility, and again, for monthly cycles, this was a huge thing of um, normalizing a diversity of women cycling. And I think that's what that's a huge thing for us. And it doesn't have to be just women. It's normalizing a diversity of people cycling. But for us, um, seeing that there were so few women represented in the cycling community a lot of the time was a huge thing. And we really wanted to address that because I think it is to say that if you are, um, and as I know from my friends and from people in my, my communities that are, there are plenty of mothers with kids in tow and with their kind of, with the baby seat on the back of the bike and um, women with different ability issues. My mother who um, is a woman who finds it very uncomfortable to walk over a long distance, who finds it quite uncomfortable to drive over a long distance, but who's quite comfortable on a bike if she can have roads that are safe enough to do so. Um, and just seeing that there is a diversity of people who would benefit from it and changing that very binary, this is for, and we see this narrative over and over again, this is, these interventions are for this, this minority of people over here who we visibly see on the roads. And we forget about, as Maho has made, like as, as um, almost banging your head on the screen at one point there, I think trying to get the um, idea through to us that um, of a, a particularly an immigrant population who are disproportionately represented on bikes on our streets and um, women and people with disabilities and people who are older people, children, um, and just remembering those demographics and remembering their needs and putting them front and centre, both in how we communicate the issues, but also in how, and really importantly, more fundamentally in how we design the issues as well. So. I think that's my last bit. And I think just on class as well, I just, final thing. One of the best things in Dublin of late is the Royal Canal Greenway. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, and it's down in, a, um, in the heart of working class inner city Dublin. And it's a beautiful amenity. And there's a tension there between whether it's for the commuters or whether it's for the community. We see that tension, but it is also a wonderful, a wonderful thing and a wonderful opportunity. I'm shutting up, sorry, Louise. I'm done. <laughs> Okay, um, so we have some research coming out soon. Um, Minister, we'll, we'll seek an appointment with you to, to chat it through and it'd be brilliant to kind of get your eyes on it. Um, and it is going to be looking at this, these ideas around social inclusion. So this is one chapter in a series, making up a kind of a, a series of research. Um, and we are really looking to change this conversation. This evening has been a brilliant opportunity. Thank you all so much for staying with us. Um, Evie's dog, I think, has come and to say, we need to go for a walk, we need to go, <laughs> please let me out. Um, but thank you, Evie, thank you, Joan, thank you, Maho, thank you, Finola, thank you, Janet, thank you, Ona, thank you, Minister. Um, it's it's part, it's the start of a conversation and it's, it's brilliant that you've all taken part and spoken so honestly and so intelligently and interestingly about your experiences. We're going to wrap it up um, and this recording will be made available. If you want to share it with other people, please do. And we'll see you again for the next stage of this research. So thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Louise.